Welcome to St. John's Episcopal Church in Decatur, Illinois. This historic place of worship stands on the corner of El Dorado and Church Streets. The 166-year-old church has seen its share of successes and challenges. In the early 1850s, a few Episcopal families started meeting at each other's home. In time, these dedicated people decided to form a church parish, regardless of the cost or time they would need to invest. St. John's has been the only Episcopal parish to flourish in Decatur to this day. Fifteen residents drafted and signed articles of organization for the newly founded church, St. John's Protestant Episcopal in Decatur, Illinois. The original charter states, We whose names are hereunto to affixed do hereby associate ourselves under the name of St. John's Parish in communion with the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America. The Episcopalians gratefully elected Father Stephen Child to be the first rector. Child and his wife had a young family and they were expected to provide energetic leadership to the new mission. But as it turned out, in November of 1855, Child held his first and only service as St. John's Rector. Unfortunately, he became gravely ill with typhoid fever and quickly passed away. The church was terribly shaken as the members had no building, little money to work with, and now, unbelievably, no rector. It was at this turning point parishioners first realized that the work of the church was indeed up to the people and should not be left solely to the rector. This knowledge has always guided and served St. John's. Child's death would be the first of many hardships resulting from short tenures of early rectors. Most of the rectors from the mid to late 1800s stayed less than two years which made it challenging to develop parish consistency. Priests left for a variety of reasons, but the most common was the church's struggling financial condition. This predicament prevailed for many years, and invariably short finances meant the rector's salaries were often affected. Thankfully, despite early struggles, St. John's has been privileged to have many excellent rectors who brought their gifts and talents to the church. Parishioners have been able to adapt and utilize the particular expertise that the current rector possessed. The church initially rented meeting space at the Old Masonic Lodge located on the northwest corner of Lincoln Square. Although they were thankful to have a place to meet, parishioners soon found the room inconvenient as it was a schoolroom during the week. The furniture consisted of desks and benches that were uncomfortable to sit in as they were too small for most adults. Additionally, the furniture was attached to the floor, only leaving space in the aisles to stand or kneel. The equipment for the service was truly inadequate for a traditional Episcopalian Mass. No organ existed, no choir was available, and even prayer books were scarce. St. John's now had 22 communicants and services moved to the third floor over Fenton's store. This room was better suited for the small congregation as it was furnished with benches and a communion rail. Here, the second confirmations were held. Under the leadership of Reverend William Bostwick, the parishioners began thinking about building a new church that would be their own. A lot on the northwest corner of North Water near El Dorado Street was selected and then purchased for $500. On April 5, 1858, the Vestry approved plans for the new building. The layout was derived from a book of building designs written by Mr. Richard Upjohn, titled Rural Architecture. St. John's parishioners joined other Episcopalians from the East, whose building spread Richard Upjohn's Gothic Revival style throughout the United States. The small building design chosen for St. John's was described as simple and non-intrusive, with sharply geometric forms. It was to be a wooden Gothic structure, 24 by 57 feet, with an open roof and designed for a recessed chancel. 
The first church building was a small board and batten wooden structure, very representative of the mid 1800s. This technique was a unique way to apply lumber by nailing large pieces vertically and then to cover the seams with a narrow board. This approach protected the building from outside weather, including rain and snow. Unlike many of Upjohn's churches, St. John's lacked funds for constructing a steeple at that time. The final cost for the wooden church would total approximately $3,000. Controversy soon surrounded the new construction. The church plans called for a cross on each gable of the roof. At least one member of the vestry overlooked this detail and voiced objections to this proposed plan. His background led him to believe such symbols were Romish. These were some of the first Christian crosses ever to be put up in Decatur on the exterior of a building. Later, many other churches followed suit and used crosses and their churches on an even larger scale. This small wooden chapel would prove to serve the parish very well as the main center for worship until 1890 for weddings, Eucharist, baptisms, confirmations, and funerals. In 1889, parishioners began to think about building a new church building to support growth in the congregation and the community. Soon parishioners were enthusiastically making plans for building a new church edifice. Two laymen purchased lots at the corner of Church and El Dorado Streets for $5,000. Part of the excitement was undoubtedly driven by having a new leader, as Montgomery Moore Goodwin became rector of St. John's. The call to St. John's had been unsolicited by Reverend Goodwin. March 12, 1889 would prove to be a turning point in St. John's history, as the new rector set into action a plan to build the new stone church building. The Herald newspaper reported, At the close of his sermon on Sunday morning, Reverend M. M. Goodwin, rector of St. John's Episcopal Church, stated that he believed the Episcopalians of Decatur should have a better and more commodious church building in which to worship, and gave notice to his congregation he would set aside the Easter offering for the commencement of a fund for a new church building. The Friends of St. John's Parish would like to see the movement carried to a successful issue. On Easter Sunday of 1890, another offertory for the proposed building of $700 was collected. Plans were then made to buy the lots at the northeast corner of El Dorado and Church Streets from the two parishioners who had held them for the new building. Noted architect Henry F. Starbucks submitted plans. They were selected by the church. His proposal combined early English and decorated Gothic styles. It was to follow traditional basilica lines that included a chancel in the east, ambulatory, south porch, baptistry at the church entrance, and a clerestory. St. John's design was only one of Starbucks projects at this time. He was also busy designing Trinity Parish Church in Seattle, Washington, Trinity Episcopal Church in Michigan City, Indiana, and First Presbyterian Church, only a few blocks down Church Street from St. John's in Decatur. Starbucks would go on to design dozens of buildings across the country, Many of his buildings still stand in 2021, and several have been listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The new lot measured 93 by 134 and a half feet and faced west. It was touted in local newspapers as one of the last major corner lots available in the city. Other churches in the city had considered purchasing a lot for their new buildings, including First Congregational Church, which would soon erect a building across the street. Initially, it was proposed that the new stone church would cost about $30,000 and have a seating capacity of four to 500. Later figures indicate the church actually cost at least $43,000. On September 23, 1890, the cornerstone was laid on the grand new church's foundation. The rector, Reverend M. M. Goodwin, had carefully planned all the arrangements for the ceremony. The services were conducted according to the Episcopal Church's rites, and they were directed by Right Reverend George F. Seymour, Bishop of the Diocese. Mrs. Ellen Philbrook, church historian, reported in the 1899 History of St. John's. A temporary floor had been laid over the joist, which were already in place. Seats were provided for a great many, while others stood. 
a number of carriages were drawn up in easy hearing distance. Keepsakes included the following in the cornerstone. A Bible, prayer book and hymnal, Episcopal newspapers, city newspapers, autographs of noble contributors, the services used, and a history of the parish to date. While the new church captivated the parishioners' energies, the old wooden chapel was still the heart of St. John's as it had been for 30 years. November 22, 1890, the wooden church was moved to what would later become the site of the stone church. Later accounts recall when the building was moved onto the new location, it was placed securely on top of an old tree stump for support. The parishioners had carefully thought about every detail of the new construction. Their dedication was reflected in the church's attractive appearance, both inside and out. Between Starbucks' ecclesiastical expertise and parishioners' care, the church was intricate in all areas. The church outside was of red sandstone from Darlington, Wisconsin, and Iowa, with a Virginia black slate roof. This sandstone included bright reds and orange stones when the church was constructed. The porous stone soon turned black from the soot of burning coal and Decatur manufacturing. The black church stone was restored in the mid-1990s and the beautiful colors finally returned. The architectural plans were considered to be Gothic because they followed traditions representing the 13th century. Like many churches, the chancel was located at the east side and was heptagonal in shape. St. John's represents the best of Gothic design. During the 1892 dedication service, former rector Father W. H. Moore gave the sermon entitled What Mean These Stones? from Joshua 421. He reflected on the need for a specialized church building. He explained the significance of the dedication was that of setting apart the building to be used from then on for holy purposes. He reminded the people attending the service that the church represents the visible fellowship of all those who profess and call themselves Christians. This theme from the dedication has lasted throughout the history of St. John's. The beautiful Gothic-inspired church has been maintained painstakingly through the years to reflect the same tenor as when it was created in 1892. Many of the items that were described in local Decatur papers still exist in original form today. Local newspapers at the time congratulated the parish regarding the new church and covered each and every detail thoroughly in a multiple-page spread. They described the church as, quote, the handsome structure which has been the object of so much thought, so much care, and so much earnest effort. The church's main entrance was located at the bell tower on the southwest corner of the building on Church and El Dorado streets with the bright red door. Later renovations changed the entrance to be closer to the parking lot, though on special occasions the bell tower entrance is still in use. The bell tower itself is about 100 feet high was originally finished with an eight-foot-high copper cross. In the 1950s, safety concerns led to the removal of the steeple on the bell tower. The roof would be nearly flat for 40 years. During the 1990s, a major restoration campaign called Century 2 was completed and restored the bell tower to its original prominence. On the northeast corner was a choir room that included a unique porch for the choir boy's entrance. Eight stained glass windows lit the choir room. Later renovations would enclose this porch and turn it into the vesting room for the choir. Near the back of the church and the main entrance was the baptistry. This location of the baptistry at the rear of the church is in line with traditional Gothic church planning, which helps remind parishioners as they enter the church of their own baptismal covenant. Marble steps led from the church to the baptistry floor. Since the founding of the church, the baptismal font has been replaced several times. The current font is white marble and was installed in 1964. The current font weighs approximately 1,500 pounds and required additional floor bracing to accommodate the change. Just beyond the baptismal font, the baptistry area is decorated with seven original stained glass square windows which were a gift to the church from St. Martha's chapter. The windows highlight an illuminated cross in the center, with six cherubs viewing the middle window. 
Another memorial on the baptistry is the chandelier, which was given by William and Edgar Quinlan, sons of W.J. Quinlan, in memory of their sister Ethel. For unknown reasons, it was removed in 1937. During Easter week of 1977, the restored antique fixture was returned to its rightful place in the church where it now remains. The chandelier was rededicated 97 years after the Quinlan infant's death. Above the baptistry is one of the most remarkable artifacts in the nave of St. John's. This artifact is a sizable and intricate rose window in the nave's upper west wall. It was the gift from early ladies' guilds. Its most prominent figures were the Alpha and Omega with other ecclesiastical symbols. Four square windows located directly below the rose window represent the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. While beautiful, the window has proven to be a challenge to maintain. Starting all the way back in 1924, it's been reinforced, cleaned, repaired, and stabilized multiple times. During the 1990s, the rose window was totally removed from the church for several months when it was taken to a repair facility in Wisconsin. The cracked wooden frame and storm window were replaced. The new frame was made from stainless steel, and it was designed by a parishioner at the time, Randy Canfey, so that future generations could continue to enjoy the beauty of this window. Down a couple of steps from the baptistry, the nave is directly east of the baptistry. Two rows of columns support the arched roof. The trusses are made of red oak and the ceiling is black ash. The nave originally had three entrances, which included the bell tower, and two portrait entrances on the north and south sides of the baptistry, and the floor is of hardwood. According to Starbucks plans, the pews, manufactured by the Cater Furniture Company, were early English-style oak, paneled and carved with a piano finish. As El Dorado and Church Streets became major thoroughfares, and the parking lot for the church shifted to the north side of the building, the two porch entrances near the baptistry were no longer needed. In the 1970s, they were enclosed with glass, and the outside stairs were then removed. Later, in 2002, Two etched windows were placed in these alcoves at the west end of the nave in memory of Father Edward Holt, who died in 1999, and the loved ones of Bob and Betha Tibbetts. Like many Gothic-style churches, St. John's has exposed ceiling beams running the nave's entire length. These beams are reminiscent of the bottom or keel of a boat. In earlier times, shipwrights often constructed the ceilings because the area was about a ship's size. Since the 12th century, the meeting space reserved for the congregation became the upper half of the ship and was called the nave. This tag was derived from the medieval Latin word navis, which means boat or ship. The startling blue and gold clerestory windows at the top of the nave represent the incarnation colors. These 20 windows were the gift of the ladies of the church. These windows were also extensively repaired in the early 2000s to protect them. Two unique fixtures in the nave included an original polished brass lectern given in memory of Mr. Samuel Tibbetts and a brass pulpit adorned with the Eagle of St. John, given in Thanksgiving by the Burroughs family in 1895. The initial ceiling lights were a combination of gas and electric fixtures, and the current fixtures were updated in the 1980s to Gothic electric lights. Moving east in the nave, the chancel is apsidal, or semicircular, with 21 amber and gold windows at the top. And each window is a cross, outlined of jeweled glass. The windows were a gift from Mrs. Lavinia Burroughs in 1892. During early morning hours, these windows shower the chancel with glowing yellow light. The original altar was of English oak and inscribed with the words, Holy, 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 this do in remembrance of me. 
This altar was reduced in the 1940s in size and moved to the north side of the nave. It is now known as the side altar. The present high altar was installed in memory of lifelong communicant Sophia Shade in 1945. The polished oak shelf or credence table is at the altar's right, with flowers extending up the wall about three feet. The communion rail is of ash and upheld by brass supports, leading to silver passion flowers. However, the most beautiful part of the building is likely the stained glass windows in the nave. The 1890 vestry determined that the windows should depict the life of Christ. Only three of the windows were complete before the dedication services in 1892. These masterpieces were crafted by Lamb and Company of New York. Those windows included Christ in the Temple, Christ blessing the little children, and the Angel of the Resurrection. At the time, the other windows contained yellow and blue Tiffany-style glass that complemented the beautiful nave. Completing the rest of the memorial windows would take the congregation over 90 years. The completed windows generally follow the wishes of the original vestry. The nave stained glass windows include the following depictions. The Annunciation of Mary in 1982. The Nativity, 1946. Christ in the Temple, 1892. Woman at the Well, 1982. A door that was originally the window from 1970. The Little Children, 1892. The Good Shepherd, 1981. The Resurrection, in 1892. The Ascension in 1973. Back in 1892, despite the planning and careful devotion, two key items remain incomplete. The memorial stained glass windows were only partially complete. The other pressing need would be resolved more quickly. The New Stone Church had been dedicated without an organ. The organ that the church had been using from the wooden chapel was simply not powerful enough for the size of the stone church. Later that summer, a suitable organ was located and installed. Since that time, St. John's organ has always provided exquisite music due to continual upgrading, renovations, and maintenance. This Roosevelt Opus 146 organ was originally built for St. Clement's Episcopal Church in Chicago, Illinois. When the church closed, it provided an opportunity for St. John's to acquire the organ. 
This new organ was equal to any in mid-state Illinois. The cost was about $4,000. The instrument was built in the organ chamber and when in position appeared as if it had been part of the original structure. The organ console was located underneath the pipes on the north side of the chancel. Since the installation of the original organ, St. John's has had several organ renovations by different companies. The renovations allowed the console of the organ to eventually be moved to the south side of the chancel so that the organist could also direct the choir. The current organ was rebuilt by Howell Organ Company of Dixon, Illinois. The door near the current organ console leads to the sacristy and to the porch. On the southeast corner of the church is a stone porch with a pressed brick floor. This porch originally led to the rector's study, which was illuminated by southern stained glass windows. Later renovations would change this space into an area called the sacristy, where items are kept and prepared for worship services. The ambulatory hallway has an interesting story to tell. Originally, the old wooden church sat immediately against the stone church. In 1970, the church decided to demolish the decaying wooden structure built in 1858, and a new brick east wall was required. The new wall was completed and the doorway to the original church was restructured. On the other side of the ambulatory hallway is the old choir room. Originally, this choir room had an exterior door for use of the boys' choir. The exterior door was sealed in 1970, and later choirs used this area for vesting. Back out through the old choir room and looking down the hallway, these double doors mark the end of the original church area, and now lead to the parish hall that was built in 1955. Out the double doors and to the left is an enclosed glass hallway called the Cloister. It was added in 1970 to allow access to the church from the parking area. Also in this area is the Maris Memorial Garden, which was added in 1972 between the old choir porch and the Cloister. In the garden is the Columbarium for the parish. The Columbarium is an attractive group of niches that contains the cremated remains of the deceased. Parishioners requested a columbarium because the church, or the church courtyard, has traditionally been the final resting place of the faithful departed. Between the Marist Garden and the cloister, two etched glass windows were installed in memory of Roberta Munson and Lou Templin. In 1955, this parish hall was added to provide additional space for meetings, Christian education, and fellowship. Additional modifications in 1970 brought more space and classrooms. An untold number of meetings, meals, receptions, showers, and service projects have taken place in this space over the last 70 years. One update to the parish hall has included a new chapel that was created for smaller services and worship. The chapel was enhanced by stained glass windows which represent the shields of the 12 apostles. Each window contains a colorful symbol diamond background, and an inscription. Many of the wooden fixtures in the chapel were built by Jack Gordy and his family, and the kneelers were designed by parishioner Marty Elliott. Back in the parish hall, 12 additional memorial windows were added in 2007 to depict various activities that take place in the community, ranging from charity to fishing to weddings. Directly outside of the parish hall stands another building that the church has used since 1916. The home, built by George and Eugenie Bacon at 130 West Del Dorado, was constructed in 1882, ten years before St. John Stone Church had been completed. The brick house originally had a generous 50 feet of frontage on El Dorado Street. St. John's had been interested in the house for years. St. John's has used the Bacon House, also known as St. Mary's Hall, as a rectory for Christian education, volunteer activities, and for office space. The house was extensively renovated several times during its long history with the church. Many parishioners feel a very strong connection to the property. It will continue to serve the church well for many years to come. Between the Bacon House, the parish hall, and the church itself, through the years newspapers have often reported on the comings and goings at St. John's. 
One such article captured the essence of the church building when it reported that, quote, Artistically, the architecture of St. John's Episcopal Church in Decatur, Illinois is frozen music. Classical in its renderings, only limited in its influence by the appreciation of the one who beholds it. Beyond just the Gothic architecture and beautiful fixtures, this 166-year-old church has more history to be written. Decades of congregations have stories of love, laughter, heartache, and sadness, spiritual growth, and for some, calls to the priesthood. It's baptized babies, confirmed children, married young lovers, nurtures families, and in the end, buried the dead. The definitive history of St. John's has left impressions etched on the minds and hearts of those who have loved it throughout its existence. Those memories can never be taken away, nor their impact understated. The mission of St. John's is to know Christ and to make him known to others. This church is more than just its beautiful buildings. The church is alive as a loving and devoted congregation to its parishioners and to the community. We encourage you to visit St. John's anytime for fellowship and worship.